Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join us as we learn from area professors and teachers as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for today. Now, here is today's program. Thanks so much for joining us in the Word again this week. We continue our series uh, studying a wonderful topic, the faithfulness of God. You know, we often think about having faith in God, believing in God, but uh, the basis of our faith in God is actually our confidence in the faithfulness of God. And we're in the fourth of five lessons on that uh, topic, and we're glad that you joined us again for it. Dr. Roberts and I are, are here looking forward to good another good, uh, good lesson in this series. And we've been in the Old Testament. Yes, uh, we'll this. be for a while. And we'll be, and that's, that's good. We've been jumping around a little bit, yeah. uh, <laughs> looking at, at topics, uh, passages on this topic. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're back into the early history of the Israelite people in the book of Numbers today. Yes. Um, the book of Numbers describes the experience of the Israelites from their, the time of their exodus from Egypt uh, up until their readiness to enter the promised land. Yeah, the, the English title is Numbers because of census numbers and so forth, uh -huh. but the Hebrew is referred to as the wilderness wandering, mm -hmm. which is really what it is. Yeah, so it's that intermediate period that uh, covered about 40 years Mm -hmm. uh, from the time of the Exodus and their journey to Sinai uh, to their entrance into the Promised Land. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very important transitional period. Oh, yes. Uh, it's also a very sad period of time. With, with, uh, there's, there's some faithfulness and following going on here. A lot, a lot, of, lot of grumbling. A lot of grumbling, <laughs> a lot of distrust um, uh, aimed at Moses. Their, political and political leader and Aaron, their spiritual leader, and mm -hmm. ultimately at God. Yes, really God. Uh, so um, there, there's kind of a sadness too. And there, there's a little, little pall of sadness hanging over our passage today. There is. Because as with many of the lessons we've been <clears throat> studying lately, uh, we see the faithfulness of God kind of in spite of human uncertainty, unfaithfulness, mm -hmm. rejection things like that, and, and that's going to be a characteristic of our story today as yes. well. Yeah. One of the things that shocked me when I finally studied this uh, section of Scripture carefully was how quickly the Israelites got from Egypt and the Exodus to Sinai and the giving of the law and up to the borders of the Promised Land, Canaan. Right. It only took them two years. It, it didn't take long compared to the 40 they were there. Yeah, yeah. It was a minimal yeah. time. So I, I was, because I, I, I grew up thinking, well, it took them 40 years to get to the border. No, it actually took them only two years to get to the border. All that we read about their journey, their exodus and their journey to Sinai, the giving of the law, the building of the tabernacle, mm -hmm. organization of the camp, all of that, very quick. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the 40 years are spent cooling their heels in the northern Sinai Peninsula Waiting for what? <laughs> Till that generation died. <clears throat> and that's a re yeah. result of what we're talking about today and next lesson. Yeah, the, <clears throat> waiting for the generation of grumblers mm -hmm. and uncooperative uh, Israelites to die out yes. so that God could lead a more responsive younger generation into the promised yeah. land. It's like they got to that point and then they're treading water. Yeah. Just waiting until finally they can go in. So instead of uh, what I had pictured, 38 years of kind of aimless wandering around the Sinai Peninsula, it was actually 38 years of what you're saying is treading water, yeah. waiting for that generation right to die Kedesh off. Yeah. yeah. It made me think how sad it would be to be the generation, to be a generation of believers for, for whose death God had to wait <laughs> until he was able to move <clears throat> his, his will forward yeah. for his people. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope I'm not part of a generation like that. <laughs> well, um, the, the, the immediate context of our passage in Numbers 13 
uh, has a whole lot of grumbling going on. Oh, yes. And they found everything. They, they grumbled against Moses' leadership. Uh, they grumbled about the quail that they had to eat. Uh, you, you talked last week with uh, Dr. Blackburn <laughs> about the grumbling over the manna, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now they're grumbling about the quail. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they were tired of quail casserole, I guess. <laughs> uh, and then in the uh, immediately preceding chapter, 12, they found something new to complain about. Well, Moses' leadership. Yeah. Miriam and, and Aaron complained about him and his foreign wife. Yeah. His... Uh, Moses' sister and brother, who uh, they formed like kind of a triumvirate of, of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, Miriam was a, a prophet, and uh, Aaron was a priest, and Moses is the leader. And yeah. they, they had worked well together, it seems like. But now they're squabbling siblings, but leading siblings. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they, they're squabbling over uh, the fact that he had married a Cushite right. a woman. So... Uh, that's that's in the immediate background. Yeah. But with that aside, there's a plan now to make final preparations to enter the promised land, mm -hmm. which God had been um, promising to them ever since the call of Abraham. Yeah. This this land of Canaan that they were expecting to go into, they were right the on the border. Yeah. Time They're to ready, move. Ready to go. Yeah. All right. We're we're gonna we're gonna uh, skip all over Numbers 13 and then move into Numbers 14. So okay. if you read that for us. We'll read verses 1 and 2, then drop down to 17 and 18, then 25 to 28, Numbers 13. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe send one of its leaders. Then the following verses name those leaders and tribes. Verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. And again, more details about what they were looking for than verse 25. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Then chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, and then 5 through the first part of 10. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. In verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Well, we said this was a dark uh, it is. passage, and uh, it, it, is, it is kind of dark. Um, From such a tremendous report of how beautiful and wonderful the yeah. land is, and they're ready to stone them. Yeah, and they, they give uh, such a beautiful statement about trust in God. Yes. Uh, to, I mean, what's your response to being challenged to keep your trust in God? Yeah. Stone the messengers, right? right? Yeah. 
Uh, well, back to uh, Numbers 13, <coughs> chapter 1. Let's, let's notice a few uh, examples of the wording here, and then we'll think about how this applies to us. Um, now, the, Numbers 13, verse 1, makes it clear that God is, is behind this plan to reconnoiter the land. He's telling Moses, send people to right, explore it, right. to spy it out. Right. I wanna, uh, we want to point that out because some of our, our viewers may well have read the repeated version of this account early in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy mm -hmm. goes back and retells the mm -hmm. history of this period, and there it implies, well, it does more than imply. It says that the people came to Moses and said, before we go into this land and try to conquer it, we need to check it out. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it was the people's idea. Here it sounds like it's God's idea. Yeah. And I, I think we can say with some confidence that there's not a major contradiction here. The, the people frequently bring needs to Moses, mm -hmm. desires and needs, and Moses consults God about them, and mm -hmm. God frequently says, yeah. yeah. And we'll see this later with the people coming to Samuel wanting a king. Ah, true. And God says, okay, give them a king. So then, yeah, so then he gives instructions to Samuel right. about how to choose a king. Mm -hmm. So th that, that's a good uh, analogy. There's something similar to that going on here. So mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about some major contradiction yeah. here. Whose idea was it? Well... Moses, God, and the people are all yeah. consulting together, as it were. It's sort of a due diligence. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, the word spy was always used when I was a kid, the 12 mm -hmm. spies. And I had this notion of people wearing trench coats with turned up <laughs> collars and slouch hats, sneaking from tree to tree. <laughs> Little did I know there aren't that many trees to sneak. Uh, at any rate, they were just travelers, weren't right. they? Just, yeah. just traveling through the land, but keeping their eyes open, mm -hmm. kind of record, scouting things out, not yeah. really spying out. Yeah. And Canaan is what the land has always, had always been called, even when Abraham lived mm -hmm. there. Right. Um, it, it, it will eventually become Israel, yeah. but uh, it has been called Canaan, and it still is being called Canaan. And it had been God's desire for them to live there ever since the call of Abraham. Mm -hmm. um, now, these leaders, uh, each tribe was to supply a leader. So we had 12 people mm -hmm. checking out Canaan, and two of them we, we need to know by name, don't we? Right, yeah. Joshua and Caleb. Right, and, and they are mentioned in those intervening verses 3 through 16 that mm -hmm. aren't in our printed text. Now, Caleb was one of the leaders of the tribe of Judah. Right. Uh, which was a, one of the most important tribes. And uh, Joshua was the, a leader from the tribe of Ephraim, Ephraim, which was also one of the most important tribes. Right. So you've so, got a major in the south and a yeah, major in the north. Exactly. Right? So it's, it's not surprising that these two take the lead. What, what we didn't, wouldn't have known is that they're the ones with a very positive reading mm -hmm. uh, against the majority with, who are going to have a negative reading. Yeah. Um, when Joshua is first mentioned in that list of leaders, his he's called Hosea. Right. There, there's an interesting group of names: the prophet Hosea, or then there was a king Hosea. Mm -hmm. He's called Hosea. He gets his name changed by Moses to Joshua. Yeshua. And that becomes Yeshua. And who's Yeshua? Jesus. That's Jesus. Yeah. So all those names are from the same root, the Shua root meaning a deliver or save. The Joshua, with a J on it, uh, adds the idea of Jehovah or Yahweh, Yahweh. Yeah. Um, the Lord. Uh, so the Lord delivers, or the mm -hmm. Lord is our deliverer. Mm -hmm. uh, gr great name for, for Joshua yeah. there. Okay, so now we know about Caleb and Joshua. And they're sent uh, to explore Canaan, they're told to go up through the Negev. What's, That's the, the southern Negev? border area to the very south of, of Israel. Yeah. It's the southernmost part of Israel as it kind of bleeds down into the Sinai Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And the word literally means dry. Hmm. 
the the dry south. It's a dry desert type uh, yeah, region. Yeah, and so it's it's the southern part. And some in some Bible translations, it'll just say the south mm -hmm. rather than the Negev. Uh, but they're also to go on up out of the south and check out the hill country. What's the lay of the land in Canaan well, like? The hill country is kind of the Midlands mm -hmm. all the way through, and and eventually. After the time of the conquest by Joshua and they settled in the land, the area that they control is the hill country. The plains, the, the flat areas where chariots were used, mm. they were not able to control, but they did have the hill country. Right. So they, had, they always struggled to control the coastal plain mm -hmm. over by the Mediterranean, and they struggled some to control the Jordan Valley. Mm -hmm. But it is this hill country, this central highlands that yeah. they were able to control. Um, we're also told uh, that they have two main missions uh, in verse 18. They're, uh, they, they're to reconnoiter the agricultural output of the, of the area, mm -hmm. see what the land is like, mm -hmm. and they're also to evaluate the military uh, prognosis. See whether the people are strong or weak, few or many, and he goes on to elaborate whether the cities are walled, fortified, and then question is the land rich or poor? Are there trees? Mm -hmm. They're looking specifically to find out things, and they're they're told to bring back fruit, mm. grapes, pomegranates, and figs. Yeah, which they do, and they do. So they yeah. find it uh, to be a fertile land, oh, yes. growing a variety of crops. Mm -hmm. um, my wife Pat and I visited Peru recently mm -hmm. and learned that the Peruvian, the Incans, the ancient Incans, developed 4,000 varieties of potatoes and 600 varieties of corn. Uh. <laughs> and I thought, well, if you like potatoes and corn, that's a good place to, <laughs> to be from. But here we've got some agricultural variety right. as well, don't yeah. we? In fact, one of the uh, clusters of grapes was so big and so heavy, they had to put it on a pole and <laughs> carry it between two, two people. Two of them came from the valley of Eshkol, which yeah. means cluster. Yeah, grape cluster. Yeah. So that it, that was a well-named place. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so the they're given very specific instructions. They need agricultural reconnaissance and military reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. And so let's see what report uh, they come back with. Uh, at the end of 40 days. Now, the, the, that number 40 pops up all the all time, the time. Yes. doesn't it? Especially yes. in the Old Testament, yeah. but even in the New. Oh, yeah. And, of course, one way to read it is just to take it absolutely literally. Count them off 40 days. Uh, 40 days, and which, which may well be the case. But many, many scholars are convinced that 40 was more of a rounded number. About a dozen. You know, we use expressions of various numbers. Six and one, half a dozen of the other, uh -huh. we'll, you know. Yeah. So it, it may have meant a good long time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, or enough time or a thorough time or mm -hmm. something like that. So it doesn't matter if it was exactly 40 days or not. It, it may well have been. Uh, so they come back with this report. Um, and here in verse 26 is the mention of that place, Kadesh, that we mm -hmm. had talked about. That's where they're encamped, right on the southern border. An oasis area. Yeah. So um, they're supposed to come back with an agricultural report and a military report. What's the agricultural report? Oh, it's flowing with milk and honey. Yeah. Now that would be a little messy, wouldn't yeah. it, to, to walk around in a land. <laughs> so what, what's the point of milk and honey? Well, with milk, you've got your domesticated animals, your, your product of the, the work that you do. But mm -hmm. the honey is the natural, the vegetation, the, the natural production that's there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's both. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's there's good pasture mm -hmm. for animals that provide milk, mm -hmm. etc. And there's also good um, plant life with plenty of flowers yeah. for the bees to make honey bees, out of. Yeah. Okay. So it's it suggests agricultural productivity. Right. And uh, after they announce that it is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey, they say, ta-da, here's, here's the fruit. Right. So they have the pomegranates, figs, and grapes to show them. Yeah. Now, verse 28 gives the other side of the picture, the, uh, the military reconnaissance. Yeah. 
And that word but is a very strong word of contrast. Yeah. It kind of means on the contrary. So, People are powerful, cities are fortified, they're very large. Even saw descendants of Anak, that's giant. Yeah, Anak, Nephilim. the Anakim were uh, proverbial for being very large, very tall, very warlike. Mm -hmm. And they believed them to be the descendants of the Nephilim, which are giant creatures, uh, beings, yeah. I should say, not creatures, beings. Uh, that are mentioned way, way back in Genesis chapter 6. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're, they give a, a negative report about the, um, about the military readiness of the land. Mm -hmm. The next uh, verses, the, the ending verses of chapter 13, go ahead and list some of the various tribes, mm -hmm. warlike tribes who live yeah. in that land, the Amalekites, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, and Canaanites. So there are a lot of ites, <laughs> ites there, in the right. land. Yeah. yeah, Caleb, on the other hand, uh, speaks up. Let's go take it. Yeah. We can do it. <laughs> we are able, he says. Uh, yeah. we, we are well able to do this. You've got to love Caleb's spirit and faithfulness here. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the other ten the who majority. checked it out, they, they contradict him directly. They yeah. say, no, we are not able yeah. And they bring up the military strength. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Many of our viewers will have remembered um, that they say, compared to those Anakim, we're just grasshoppers. Right. They're giants, we're grasshoppers. Yeah. I, I came upon a quote recently, and I can't remember where, but it has really haunted me. It's a quote by Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who said at one point, comparison our tendency to compare ourselves to other people. Mm -hmm. Comparison is the thief of joy. Mm -hmm. And when I was studying this and read this again. The grasshopper. We're, yeah, we're grasshoppers compared to them. Yeah. Uh, I thought, wow, that just sucked all of the confidence and, mm -hmm. and faithfulness out of them, that, com that comparison of size. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very, very effective in making the people afraid. And it represents so many of the negative emotions talked about in Scripture. Fear, mm -hmm. envy, covetousness, mm -hmm. jealousy. All, all, those, all, all based on comparison. Comparisons. Yep, yeah. they are. Mm -hmm. Not that Teddy Roosevelt is a spiritual giant <laughs> of any kind, but somehow I took his words and kind of applied them to yeah. this. Well, uh, chapter 14 then gives us the very strong reaction of yeah. the Israelite people to this. And you were pointing out earlier that the word whole assembly, they reported to the whole assembly yeah. in chapter 13. Then you come into chapter 14, and that word all or whole or entire, entire yeah. is used over and over and over. It is. It is. In a way, it's, it's a hyperbole because we know that not everybody was afraid we know Joshua, Joshua and, Caleb. and yeah. Caleb weren't. But uh, hyperbole has its positive impact here. There was just an overwhelming negative response, fearful response to mm -hmm. this report. And so that word all or whole or entire appears over and over and over again. They say some really exaggerated things uh, in verse 2. If only we died in Egypt and, yeah. or died in the wilderness yeah. Uh, now what's going to happen? We're just going to be slaughtered when we enter this promised land by all these warlike people. And they go so far in the verses that are not printed in our text, 2 through 4, to saying, let's just elect new leaders. Choose a captain and go back. And go back to Egypt. Yeah. Uh, how short our memories are, right? Yes. We they, were talking before in the yeah. previous lesson about selective memory or false mm -hmm. memory. Yeah. And uh, they're talking about how great it was in Egypt. You think, where were you? Yeah. Uh, 400 years, much of it in servitude, yeah. in terrible servitude, uh, slavery. Well, Moses and Aaron react uh, equally dramatically, mm -hmm. falling face down in front of the people. And Joshua and Caleb also tear their step clothes. Up. Yeah. What, what, is, what's involved in that's that? That's a typical expression of great anguish or, or concern to, to tear your clothes just to 
rip yeah. and, and indicate this is terrible. It could be done in any kind of grief or mourning. It's mm -hmm. especially appropriate in, uh, in the context of blasphemy. Mm -hmm. uh, remember in the, in the Gospels when the high priest tears his high priestly robes mm -hmm. because he accuses Jesus of, yeah. of blasphemy. Yeah. So uh, Joshua and Caleb try to speak out again. I mean, they do. And verse 7 is a, is a beautiful statement, a isn't it? Yes. The land we pass through is exceedingly good. So there they address the, agri the positive. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is focused on the negative. They say, hey, don't forget the positive. We can yeah. live there. But then they go on and talk about faith in God, trust in God. Right. If, look, folks, if Yahweh is pleased with us, he'll lead us into this land flowing with milk and honey, and he'll give it he'll to give us. He'll give it to us. Yeah. Right. And so don't rebel against the Lord, verse 9 says. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And then second, don't be afraid of the people. Right. Don't be afraid of the circumstances. Yeah. And what, what two great reminders for all of us, I think, mm -hmm. as we uh, wend our way through life and life's challenges, it's kind of a double thing. Don't let your circumstances dominate your thinking, mm -hmm. especially your negative circumstances, and parallel to that, keep your trust in the Lord. Right. Keep, keep your confidence in God. And they repeat that. They, God. they say their protection or shade is gone, but Yahweh is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Yeah. Yeah. Good. At the end of verse 9, right. Mm -hmm. The Lord is with us. There's keep your trust in God and don't be afraid of them. That's your circumstances. Mm -hmm. But the whole assembly is ready to stone them. That beautiful speech didn't have any effect, did it? No. They're, no. they're not only ready to rebel, they're ready to kill the messengers. Yeah, and the and, next and lesson the goes on with even more of this. Yeah. But at this point, it's a pretty negative situation. Yeah. Well, these two um, statements by Caleb and Joshua, I think, uh, need to resonate with us as we think about our lives before yeah. God and our lives in the midst of life's circumstances. The one is, is pretty obvious, the reminder that the Lord is with us. We dare not rebel against the Lord. We need to keep our trust in the Lord because He is with us mm -hmm. and God keeps His promises. Mm -hmm. I was thinking in the New Testament of a fearful situation and the Apostle Paul, when he was in a journey toward Rome and the storm was so bad that the ship was about to go down, and he reassured the other passengers, the Lord spoke to me, he will protect mm -hmm. us, don't be afraid. They still were afraid. Yeah. Some of the sailors yeah. almost mutinied. Right, but. right. The, the other side of it is not to be afraid of the giants among whom mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we often find ourselves. Our circumstances sometimes loom so large, and they are real. I'm not trying to say that uh, yeah. our circumstances are not fearful. They are fearful. But sometimes we focus on our circumstances. Sometimes we, we focus too much on ourselves and, and think, um, oh man, I'm just a grasshopper compared to that. Yeah. We focus on our weaknesses. We focus on the negative. We focus on the past. Yeah. Oh, for the good old days in Egypt. Yeah. There were a couple of verses in 1 John that came to mind to me. 1 John 3.20, whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. And then 1 John 4, 4, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. And we need to remember Those that. Those are good ones. Yeah. Well, let's not be afraid this week, and let's keep our focus on God. Thanks so much for joining us. Hope to see you next time. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson, brought to you as a ministry of First Christian Church in Johnson City, Tennessee. Our thanks to our teachers that led us for this week's lesson. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School Lesson Text. This has been a production of First Christian Church.